Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is a great opportunity for me and I really appreciate you letting me share this. I um, wrote a lot during my life, but odds and ends, I really didn't write officially until after I retired. <laughs> this is the cover of the Georgia Backroads. It's one of my articles from 2010 that appeared. It's about growing up in a small town in the 1960s. And here for the people who are here in the room, actually have these magazines here if you'd like to look through them a little later. Uh, the other article that I had, um, you want to tell me? Okay, great. Is from the Georgia magazine. It's the Georgia Electric Membership Corporation magazine. And uh, they have a small space in there called My Georgia, and I wrote about my hometown theater. My hometown theater really is special, and we'll talk about that uh, later also. As far as writing poetry, I've always loved to write poetry, but it's not my strong writing genre. But uh, if you're interested in writing poetry, I suggest that you join a local poetry group or start your own. Um, you could go to conferences like I did, the Southeastern Writers Conference at St. Simons, Georgia in June. They have all kinds of contests. You can enter um, the contest, become a mentor, uh, become a member, enter the contest, attend the conference. You get lots of feedback from poets as well as um, other writers. All the instructors there give you feedback. I do have um, re uh, uh, two poems in the 2010 anthology of the Georgia Poetry Society. That's another thing that you could become a member, attend the conference, and get your poems published in the Georgia, um, the Reach of Song, the Georgia Poetry Society. Okay, that's the writing poetry information, and you can go to georgiapoetrysociety.org to get the information on joining the Poetry Society and the Southeastern uh, Writers uh, Conference. Okay, and this is the cover of my book. This book is a murder mystery and romance that are fiction. The stories are true. Uh, the story <coughs> is fiction, but the history of the town and the granite business is definitely not fiction. It's true as I as true as I could make it. I'm often. Um, interested in how other writers get their source for material, and I thought you might like to know that too. This book was inspired by a dream. It was like five scenes in a movie, um, and I had this dream about a year before I retired. It was so real to me that I could remember it, like scene by scene. It was about this guy that was uh, driving along, a girl was walking um, on, the, on the side of the street, and he pulled over. She could hear him cut the sun, cut his radio down. It, the radio was playing 16 Candles. As the car slowed, the music went down. He called her rotten to Molly. I knew her name was Molly. I have no idea why. But it was like seeing the scene, slow moving scenes, five scenes from a movie. I took those scenes and built the story around it. Uh, as I typed in the stories, I sometimes would leave it alone for weeks at a time. Once I left it alone for two months, but I did find that even though I was not physically working with it, my mind continued to work on the story and the plot. Choosing the location. Originally I wanted it to take place in Elberton, but I was afraid I would step on some Elberton toes. So I took my first draft and placed it in a story in a mill town in South Carolina. My siblings, older siblings, grew up in Greenville, South Carolina on a mill hill, and I'd heard so many of their stories, and I thought, well, I could put it there, but I didn't grow up on the mill hill, so it didn't work for me at all. Um, I had to go back to Elberton to make it interesting, because that's what I knew, and when I started researching, I found even more good history than I remembered. I made every effort to ensure that the characters are not connected to known Elberton families, especially the bad characters. <laughs> If it looks that way to anyone, it truly is coincidental. So please don't think that you can ride down the streets in Elberton and find this family or visit with them. They just aren't there. In writing my first novel, um, I had written about 2,500 words when 
I didn't know if I had a good story or not, so I shared it with a friend from the university. She and her mother read it. One gave me lots of encouragement, and the other one said I was much too nice. Um, in my family, we weren't allowed to say any type curse word, anything that was the least bit off. And I remember my sister, who's two years older, almost got a spanking, I should say a whipping, because they weren't called spankings those days, for saying blame it. And when she got, when my mother said that that was a bad thing to do, she said, well, I didn't say any bad words, she said, but you meant to. So <laughs> she almost got a, a spanking for saying something that that wasn't a really bad word. Mama called me Marthy, and sometimes she would say, Marthy, I didn't raise you like that. I realized that I'd have to leave some of my raisings behind if I was going to tell a realistic story. After all, it is about a rape and a murder and it, that happened in the 1960s, and it's just really hard to describe such happenings with really kind, sweet words. So I left some of those raisings behind and wrote the story, took my friend's advice, and decided to write the story with words that were more appropriate for what I was trying to say. My friend's mother gave me good encouragement and told me it was a great story, so I did go um, on with it. Since I don't have a background in journalism and I don't really, I didn't really know how to write this book, I had to learn a lot of things on my own. So I, I created these tools that I call Tools to Unconfuse Me. I created a timeline and because I realized as I went by my chapters and I started filling in here and filling in there, I was getting some things out of order. So it helped me to do the timeline. The family tree was very helpful. There are three families who interacted within this book. Of course, they're fictional families, so um, I could give them fictional birthdays and so forth. But I did need that because once I changed a, a young boy, I changed his age. So then I had to go back through all the chapters and do age-appropriate things for him all the way through the book. Um, thank goodness for Find and Replace on my laptop. I cannot imagine how Margaret Mitchell ever wrote Gun with the Wind without a computer. Okay, telling the story with landmarks. Um, I was advised by a writer to not use landmarks of the name of the town, so I've kind of broken those. Oh, I did, not kind of, but I did break those rules. I used the Elmhurst Cemetery, which is a wonderful place to take people to see how the granite business did business 100 years ago as well as now. You can start at the beginning of the cemetery and see how 100 years ago so much of the monuments and headstones were done by hand. In the middle, you can see it changing over, and in the very back of the cemetery, you can see where the computerized equipment has made a difference. You can actually get your headstone etched, and you can have your family's or your grandchildren's pictures put on your headstone and etched in color. So things have changed a lot. Um, so um, the Elmhurst Cemetery is a great place to see how the granite business has changed over the years. Um, the Georgia Guidestones that I you saw on the cover of the book, they're shrouded in mystery as to the people who paid for and designed them. They have a message written in eight different languages. You can see the four large slabs and there's a different, it's the same message but different on each side. They are in English, Spanish, Swahili, Hindi, Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. When I took the picture for this book, I had not heard of and they didn't show any signs of being defaced. The only thing you can kind of see is on the very top, there's a little black spot there. Someone had thrown something up there and when I took the picture, I, had, I even on site, I could not tell what that was. But that was the only thing I saw wrong. So after this picture was taken though, within a year, someone had thrown buckets full of paint, red paint, on the stones, on several of them, and you could see where they threw it up high and it dripped down. Luckily, the granite businesses that, that keep the stones cleaned up and so forth could get that off. So since it was something easy to get off, either those same culprits or others came up and put, they did the same thing with polyurethane, which did not come off easily. I took one tour group there, and you could actually see the, the man, there was a young man there chipping away 
at the polyurethane to keep from um, taking away the lettering and, and ruining the message, he had to, to chip a fine, fine piece off all that polyurethane to get it off. When you go to see it now, you can actually see the lighter spots where the polyurethane dropped and, and dripped on it, but they did get cleaned up. Another time I took a group there and there uh, was lots of graffiti on there and chalk and ink and pencil and so forth. So it was a constant thing there for a while just to get the graffiti off the guidestones. It got so bad that the county sheriff's office put up cameras. There, there's one in the background and one in the front, so that if people come up, even if they take the cameras out there, you can see somebody doing that. So I think they've conquered that problem there. As far as the um, message on the guidestone, some people think they're evil. I do not. There's an author from the Wired magazine connected them with Apocalypse. In a recent History Channel program, the producer connected them to the Rosicrucian group. It's a Christian group that went underground when the Catholic Church chose another interpretation of Christ's life as a state religion. Um, that one's something that I've looked into, and you might want to look up that group. It's an interesting background. Some people have even connected it to Ted Turner, and I don't know how that connection is. <coughs> But, <laughs> oops, I think we have someone on the telephone line that we need to mute. Thank you. Okay, um, I have read the message as an environmental message. The last two lines admonish people to take care of nature. They've had red paint splashed on them and all kind of other things with the, the evil things that go with it, so we know that there are people who don't think that this is a, a good message or a good place to be. Uh, they were unveiled in 1980. The 10 guidelines are maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. In the History Channel program, um, they kept going back to this, and the producer kept saying that there's a group of people that would like for us to just kill off all the people over 500 million, um, which I don't think that was the intent of the message. But on one of my tours, I had a, a Mideastern man who said that if it had been transformed or transferred from um, the, trans, the Sanskrit language, it actually could have been 500 billion, which would make us more in line with what, what's happened since the 1980s. It, the, the second one is guide production wisely in proven fitness and diversity. The third one is a hun unite humanity with a living new language. The fourth one is rule, passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Protect people and nations. The fifth one is protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Six is let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Seven is avoid petty laws and useful, useless officials. Imagine that. Eight is balance personal rights with social duties. Ninth is my favorite. Prize, truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Ten is be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Because it is repeated, leave room for nature, I do feel like this is definitely a, an environmental message. If you look at the uh, top stone, the known stone at the very top where the little black spot is, there are a few words on each side of that in a different language. It says, to an age of reason. And these are in ancient dead languages, Babylonian, Classical Greek, Sanskrit, and Ancient Egyptian. These stones are located 70, on, on Highway 77, 7.7 .7 miles from Elberton. I'm sure some of us conspiracy theorists can come up with a few more 77s to make it more interesting. I understand there is a 7.7 acre farm nearby. Um, don't know where it is, but I hear it's nearby. So I'm sure as the years go by, we can come up with a few more 77s seven on here. The next one um, landmark is the Elberton Granite Bowl. It was built in 1962 by the athletic boosters in the granite industry. It's made up of over 100,000 tons of Elberton granite with approximately 20,000 granite seats. 
It's the high school football field for the Blue Devils. I understand it's quite intimidating for other teams coming over when they see this gigantic bowl um, of, con uh, of granite. In the background, you'll see the Elberton Courthouse. My next landmark is the Elberton Theater. It was built in 1940 in the Art Deco style. In the early 1950s, there was a fire that pretty much gutted the, the theater, but by the no end of the 1950s, it had been repaired and was useful. My family moved to Elberton in the late 1950s, so we were there just after it reopened. It became a teen center in 1967. Uh, it stood vacant for, many, for several years. It was restored in the late 1990s, 1990s back to the Art Deco style of the 1940s. It reopened in 2001. Uh, they have plays and other cultural events there. My sisters and I have season tickets, and we get together at least four times a year just to go to these plays. They've had it at outstanding plays there. The Encore Production Theater plays are the ones that are shown there. The Beverly Hillbillies was especially hilarious. We laughed all the way through that. We saw a um, play there just this last week that was really great and funny. It was the Joseph Technicolor coat. It was a whole new spin on the biblical version of Joseph's coat. I said Jacob, didn't I? It's Joseph's Technicolor coat. But um, you should see the new spin on Joseph's colored coat. It was interesting, but the most, the one I remember most there was To Kill a Mockingbird. It was such a wonderful play, but I've never been to a bad one, so I think you all should go and check the Elbert Theater out. The next landmark is the Granite Museum, the Elberton Granite Museum and Exhibit. It has, um, it displays antique granite working tools used for quarrying, sawing, polishing, cutting, and sandblasting granite monuments and headstones. It's the home of the sea lion, which you'll hear something a little later about, a sculptor with a good story about being made in Elberton stolen in return. And it also has this young man there. Well, not so young. He has a checkered past and is very interested. His name is Dutchy. He was the first um, statue made of Elberton granite. He was put up on the square in 1898. The ladies of the Confederate Memorial Association hired Arthur Beter, a sculptor from the Pennsylvania Dutch area, to come down and fashion a Confederate soldier. A shed was built just for his use to make duchy, um, and he started his work. What emerged from the block of granite was a short, stocky, bug-eyed soldier sporting a Yankee forage cap rather than a good old-fashioned Confederate slouch hat. He was almost immediately dubbed Dutchy as he stood on the, the square. His presence prompted a lot of people to, to say really bad things about him. They didn't like him. He didn't look like the hungry Confederate veteran back from the war. Some people went so far to claim that he dishonored the men he was supposed to be honoring. The unhappy residents of Elbert County soon took, took matters into their own hands. One night in the dark of night in July of 1900, a few locals roped Dutchy down from his, um, his place of honor on the square, pulled him off. It broke his legs at the feet uh, there on the pedestal, and it broke his legs can you do this right, here? right here at his, where his coat stops. So he was pretty much broken off his pedestal, and he um, ended up on the ground around the square. He was so heavy and, and so cumbersome that they actually did not take him off. They dug a hole and buried him right there on the square. <laughs> so imagine Dutchy being buried. He stayed buried for 82 years. And while he was buried, a new Italian sculptor came to town, took over, the shed that was made for Dutchy, and the granite business mushroomed all around him. They, they were just um, everywhere in Elbert County as well as the surrounding counties within the 82 years as Dutchy lay buried there. When he was brought out from the Georgia Red Clay, he was put on a, 
a truck, a trailer, and carried through a car wash, and the Georgia red clay was pressure washed off Dutchie, and then he was placed in the museum. Back to telling the story of the book. Um, I do use objects in telling the story. I had started the story and decided to take the murder back to the 60s, and I spent a period of time there without knowing how to take, how to connect the 1960 people with the people that were in the current story in the 2000s. So I kept trying to think of something that would be personal enough that could survive the 1960s, and one day I opened my dresser drawer, and guess what, those glasses, those 1960 glasses were sitting right there waiting for me to use them as a catalyst to bring the, the past into, into the current time. Um, telling the story was my favorite words. I have found that my speaking vocabulary is so very limited, but my writing vocabulary is unlimited. I can choose words I wouldn't normally use every day, such as cremains. When I started this story, I was talking about the ashes of people, and I went to a University of Georgia retired educators luncheon, and there was a speaker who had a background in estate planning as well as um, death issues, and one of the things he said that you could actually use your ashes and put them in a brick and place them in a wall, I didn't go for that particularly, but I did go for using his word. He didn't use ashes. He used cremains. And I like a word like meander, so I took words that I like and, and used them within the book. Um, sometimes I'll be reading a book and I'll find um, words that I like the sound of, and I'll make me a little list, and then I'll see if there's a place I can use them within my novel. I found that um, makes it a little more interesting to me, and hopefully it does to the reader. The characters in the book. When I started doing the character build, building, I felt like, first of all, I had to get my main character, who in Written on a Rock is Dee Dupree. Once I chose her gender, her age, her occupation, and so forth, uh, I could build the other characters around her. I did make her a history teacher, which means it gave me access to the past, to Elberton, the granite industry, the Elberton um, town's history the history of the 1960s um, where I grew up, so I knew a lot of that history. Um, one example of how this story took a life of its own, too, is I got really tired of making the characters in the family tree, so I kind of stuck the D. Dupree's dad. I made him adopted rather than to get busy trying to create more information behind him. Later in the book, I needed a connection. I needed um, a character that to use that I hadn't counted on, and, and there he was, just sitting on the family tree waiting to be used. So it was a good way to have a biological connection that I had not, had not known I needed. I was amazed um, when I found out the things that I would come up with that I did not know I'd need later and yet they would all fall together. Even though I really like my main character, I think my favorite character is Granny Nida. She's a combination of all the older women I've ever known in my life, like my mother. And my mother had a friend who liked to tell dirty jokes. My mother was so opposite from her. I was looking back, I'm surprised they were friends. But she really, um, she loved her friend, but she didn't like the fact that she told dirty <laughs> jokes, especially when she told those dirty jokes to my mother's grandchildren. That was not really good, but still she was one of her good friends. So I kind of combined my mother and her friends and other older women that I've known in this Granny Nida character. She could, I, as you get older, I've, and I'm trying to work on this too, I think I can get away with this some. As you get this color hair, you can get away with saying and doing things you might not, you know, 20, 30 years earlier. But I also let her use one of my stories in here that um, that I told, and, and Granny Nida does it really well. Once my older son was on the farm with his granddaddy and his daddy, and they had walked through the tall weeds in the fall, and they came out, um, they came back, and he had these little 
pink dots all over his face and his arms and his chest. And, and I thought, oh, the sugar bites, he's going to be itching so badly. And I had read somewhere not long before that if you cover those things with red fingernail polish, they won't itch. So, you know, if you look at my fingernails today, you'll see I do not have red fingernail polish. I never have really liked red fingernail polish. I'm not sure why I had it. We were visiting. We lived in Alpharetta at the time, and we were visiting in Elbert County. So I took my red fingernail polish and painted all his pink dots red. That night we went to town, and we were doing dinner at my mom's. Uh, supper, actually, is what we called it in those days. And my mama and my sister Joyce called me to the kitchen and said, look at Phil, I, I think something's wrong. And I said, oh, yes, those are just chigger bites. And my sister said, I think he's got a fever. And they both almost said in unison, he doesn't have chigger bites. He has chicken pox. I had painted all his chicken pox red. He looked a little weird for a few days, but he doesn't have any chicken pox scars, so maybe that helped there. Um, I took Granny Nida's um, <laughs> stories and her propensity to get in trouble with other things other than just her dirty jokes and used Granny Nida to give a little levity to the situation. After all, the story is a little overwhelming when you're thinking that it's a murder mystery. So I used her to bring in some lightness and some fun so that it wouldn't be a, whole, a big downer of a novel. How many words make a novel? I asked that when I got to about 47,000 words. I called a, a friend who's a writer and asked him about how many words make a novel. And he says, oh, 80,000 is about the low end. I thought I had a really good novel at 47,000. It's like, where do I get 33,000 more words? Well, so I asked some of my readers, I, get, I put the book out to some readers, and I said, tell me where my weak spots are and so forth, and it ended up being that it worked really well that I did that because I had the romance in there, and I had one friend say, you have a romance in there, and, and it has nothing, you don't have a background. It's not good enough to really get these people to where you've got them. They've got to to be together more. So it gave me a chance to expand on the romance part of the novel, and I found other holes in there. So I finally did get my words up to the, the um, 80,000. I did some creative additions. I have some poems that are in the book. Um, the Very Heart of Me, Don't Put Me on a Pedestal, Free, and Mind Chatter. The only one that actually is written for the book is free. I, Wrote that for the book. The others I already had in my computer. So I will put, I will read you the one I wrote for the book. In, in the story, the 1960 girl who was taken and never returned wrote this a few weeks before she disappeared. The title is free. I wonder how it feels to soar to the sky, to leave this earth and push away the clouds with just a fleeting thought. Uh, to never have to worry or think of human needs. I wonder how it feels to float in peaceful pleasure, to know all there is to know, to be all I can be and that be enough. I wonder how it feels to know no pain or sorrow, to have only tears of joy, to sing with the angels, to be free. Molly A. Tremaine, February 12, 1960. Some of the others are short and um, just fit parts of the story, even though I had them in my computer and had them ready. The paintings that are described in the book don't exist. Sorry about that. They, are, they exist in my mind, maybe I should say. It's called kudzu art. I don't know about you guys, but when I see kudzu growing on the edge of a field, I often can see animals or people, different things, in the kudzu art. So. Um, when I retire from writing, maybe I'll go back to painting and actually paint kudzu art because um, I really do like the forms I see. The first ones that I really saw were three pine trees covered in kudzu, and they looked like three monks. They were, uh, a taller one was in the middle. They actually had the hood, and it was darker where the face was. You could see their hands folded, and it was amazing that they all looked like three monks. And we'll go next to how I, 
got this, once I got this um, book ready, I didn't know if I had a viable book, didn't know what to do, so I joined the Oconee Cultural Arts Foundation Writers Group in February of 2007. That's where the leader of the group, Pat Adams, brought me a registration form for the Southeastern Writers Association at Jekyll Island. I filled that out and uh, decided to go to their June meeting that year. It was great. I found out that I had a viable book. It won first place in fiction. There was a small publisher out of Atlanta, that had uh, Thomas Max Publishing, that had a UR Published Award. It won that award. The instructor who chose the book, First in Fiction, had been a senior um, vice president with Avon Books before he went out on his own. He is now writing himself. And um, I was delighted to talk with him. He told me good things about the book when I would say, oh, I need an editor. And he would say, no, you're fine. And I'd say, oh, I need this. He says, no, you're fine. You have a voice and you have universal appeal. And those were the things I'd been hearing at this first conference that I went to that, that you had to have. The conference was um, really heavy for me because I didn't have the writer's background. It actually gave me a headache trying to incorporate all these things into my head. I would be exhausted at the end of the day. But I learned so much, and I actually got enough critiquing that I could clean my book up on some of the areas that needed cleaning up. Um, the, even though I thought the, the fee at the time seemed rather expensive, I have found, too, that in going to these conferences, if you enter different contests, there's usually a monetary value that goes with the awards. The last conference I went to at Southeastern Writers Association, I won enough contests that it almost paid for my uh, registration fee. So, so enter all the contests that you can. It, it certainly helps. Um, but with Thomas Max, I did get 25 books free and got the book published. That was the award itself. Okay, the book now. I've had I've done 11 tours of the book, and it's great fun to go into Elberton and show you all these landmarks that I've shown you, plus some other things. And we do this lunch at the Macintosh Coffee Shop, which is a cool shop in Elberton on a side street that um, is worth going to have lunch there, even if you're not doing the tour. So. Uh, the book continues to sell, and I continue to do some signings here and there. The story continues. In June of 2010, I decided to write another novel. It's a sequel. It takes place on an island in the coast of Georgia as well as Elberton. The kidnapper, um, it's about the kidnapping of a small child, and I've used artsy things to go through this. The theme actually is the art that's in the spirit, or the spirit of the art and the St. Simon's art, the sculptures there um, on the island, um, the faces in the tree on the island, and then some sculptures out of Elberton. With the spirits and the art, it helps solve the mystery of the kidnapping. But it's like I said there, the culprit does far more than just kidnap a child. So if you um, hopefully will read the first book if you haven't, and be ready for the second one second one soon. Thank you. Thank you for letting me participate. Oh, well. uh, Madeline, I really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Martha. And hopefully you've inspired a with the writer or somebody who's just starting out. I really appreciate it. Um, well, let's see now if we have some questions. Um, all right. Like one of hmm? Oh. Oh, okay. Um, all right, let's take a question from the audience here. What's the title of your book? Written on a Rock. Sorry, it was, some, it, it was everything in Elberton is written on a rock. And I actually meant to say, um, this is a book you can take for granted. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked up that phrase, and it did say a lot of people do misspell taking it for granted, for granted. So this is a book you definitely can take for granted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, you said that they gave you 25 free books. Did you give any kind of advice on what percentage of sales you get? Well, it was a publishing demand, so I do get a percentage, really according to how much I sell the book for. 
but I do get a royalty from the publisher occasionally. And the book this last spring went on Kindle and um, Nook. So I've had a few of those sales. Oh, good. Which is nice. Yes, I'm, I'm working up to this. And, you know, I, I Great. did it the other way around, and I got um, a contract. And I'm looking at it and wondering, you know, how typical some of the things in the contracts are. And you said you've done tours with it. Um, with your book, this contract, you know, wanted to know uh, if I would uh, join the Amazon Writers Group and this group and that group and the other group. Have you done any of that? And what do you think about it? I've not done that. I probably should look into it. One of the things with my sequel, I do plan to try to figure out if I want to go with publisher on demand. This time, I would be paying for it. I'm Certain. Or if I want to try to get an agent and get a contract, um, maybe we could even talk about this later and we could describe um, how it happened with both of us. I now have a base and I can continue doing the tours. The tours actually help me sell the book, of course. Um, and I look forward to making the decision on my second book as to whether to try to get an agent and go that way. I've not been unhappy with the success I've had on the Publish on Demand. Is that a, an online program? I'm not quite sure what Publish on Demand is. Publish on Demand is mean when it's like when you go to a publisher and it's not a national bookseller. And, and for instance, Thomas Max published the book, but it, he, he does Publish on Demand. It's, I, I can order any amount of books I want. And as, and as long as I have a good relationship with the publisher, um, I don't really have to go do anything else that I don't want to do. At this point, I've done all, all the marketing myself. What about the design of the book? I sent the picture, I sent several pictures to him, uh, to the publisher, and he chose from those pictures, and he chose the guidestone. I had a picture of Dutchie. He decided to use that within the book. It's about the second or third page over in the book, and I have a copy here I'll let you look at. But um, I sent him several Elberson pictures, and he chose the guy's name. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have a very amateur camera arrangement here, so I appreciate all of you understanding about that. I don't see any questions from the audience. Oh, let's see. Um, okay, and none on chat. So, audience, now's your chance. Um, some of you may have joined late. If you're in the audience, look down on your participants panel below. You'll see a little hand icon, and you can just click on it, and that way we'll know you have a question. And unclick it. Oh, we have a question. Good. Um, okay, Paula, you're unmuted now. Could, would you please ask your question? Yes, hi. Um, there's somebody tearing down a tree behind me. Hopefully, you don't be hearing chainsaws. But, um, Martha, I was really interested in the strategies that you had for uh, doing the timeline and the genealogy. Where did you get those ideas? Because that's that would be the thing that would strike me as very helpful, and yet I don't know if I would ever come up with that. Actually, it was the need. <laughs> what is it, the um, invention? Uh, I needed something to help me keep it straight, and that's how I figured out that the family tree thing would help me keep the character straight. And then the timeline, um, I guess I didn't read that or anything. I just figured it out for myself is that I had to figure out how to keep it straight. And those were the two things I came up with. So those seem like really great ideas. Thank you. Okay, I'm um, still messing here with the technology. All right, well, are there any other questions from the audience? No? All right, there's another question. 
to write. Oh, okay. Um, actually, I worked for the University of Georgia School of Law. I started there working for a fundraiser for one year and then went to judicial education, doing seminars for Georgia attorneys, helping administer those. I am not an attorney, um, so I worked with the administrative end of it. Then I worked there for four years, and I finished up the last 22 years of law school work with the Institute of Continuing Legal Education, doing um, administering programs for Georgia attorneys. And um, I was assistant to the director, which meant that I did whatever they asked me to do. Dealing with law, is that what made you decide to write a murder mystery? <laughs> no, actually the dream kicked that one in. And it was um, actually, and I, I made notes in the folder, put it away, and then a year later I retired. And I love to paint, and I expected to pull out the paintbrushes. And instead of pulling out the paintbrushes, I pulled out that folder. I have painted very little since. So. Well, Martha, our time's about up. But oh, one, well, one other question. I'm sorry. I was just wondering okay. if any other murder mystery writers had influenced you. Did you just kind of do it all? Um, yeah. I think my first murder mystery writer that I really liked, or mystery, was Robert Ludlum. Model, uh, novels, I really like his. But um, yeah, I, and Patricia Cromwell, yeah, she's a good one. Actually, several of them, but uh, but those are two early things. And um, there there are several others I can't think of right now, but I do tend to read that. Chronicle of the Oh, is that a good one? Henning Runkel, one of the best mystery stories there is. Great, I'll have to look into that. Well, Martha, thank you again. We certainly appreciate your coming and your wonderful slides.